Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of the Geeking Out Podcast. I'm the Athletic Geek, and uh, we got Eric Hodson back this week because, you know, we had a good time talking wrestling last time he was on the show. This time, we're going to talk about comic books. I feel like, unfortunately, sometimes on this channel, I, I don't get to talk about comics as much as I'd like to, so... Uh, <laughs> Definitely bringing a very talented artist with a lot of knowledge and respect for uh, the history of comics to talk about some of his favorites. So, first of all, once again, I really appreciate you coming on the show. Oh, thank you for having me again. Yeah, it's uh, well, the thing with fandom is you get mixed up into so many. You spend too much time on one, then you can't spend time on the other. Hey. and You got you to basically pick your battles that way. I, I feel the same way. Exactly. So, you know, if you just... when. Still tying this back to wrestling a little bit. Um, you see my show, my my normal uh, live stream. Uh, you see a giant picture of the Four Horsemen behind me. And that picture of the Four Horsemen, signed by all Four Horsemen and J.J. Dillon, is based off a Fantastic <laughs> Four cover. Yep. And if you can see all of the rest of the stuff that I have in my room, my <laughs> office here, you see a lot more references to comic book covers. So... Uh, this gentleman here on the other end of the line had, knows his stuff when it comes to comics, and he's been, you know, through the very different uh, incarnations and eras of comics. Uh, you've been reading, or you know, been, been at least you know checking them out. Uh, when you first start getting into this medium, what were some of the books, or like the characters in the books, that really drew you to comic books? The biggest, the biggest influence on me, comic book wise, early on, uh, was Iron Man. Now, okay. um, when I was a kid, my dad gave me, you know, the remnants of his comic book collection. He just handed them down to me. Unfortunately, he didn't have any X Men number ones in there or any right. other really high value stuff. There was an awful lot of Spider Man. There was an awful lot of Hulk. A few other things. Then there, there was this Iron Man book. He didn't have a lot of Iron Man, but. Me being an awkward kid, getting picked on, I kind of like the idea of hiding behind a, a suit of armor that could make me fly. And the character just really captivated me. So, like, some of the earliest books that I ever bought myself back when they were 75 cents an issue was, was Iron Man comics. And then being a, always being an artist, always drawing, that's kind of the beginning of the influence of, you know, my art stylings and Bob Layton, of course, and just the way he rendered metal and... Just the whole thing always kept always kept kept me captivated. Awesome. So, um, you mentioned Iron Man's one of your favorites. Do you have any particular favorite Iron Man stories? Uh, you know, or do you remember any particular Iron Man? You know, maybe you may you don't have to do the whole full story arc, but just maybe some yeah. of the book, the the individual issues that you remember back in the you know when you first got my, into Iron my, Man. My, my... My most memorable, because like when I, right when I started buying it was when Armor Wars was going on. And for those who don't remember, Armor Wars basically it's when everybody starts stealing Stark's tech, starts making their they're making their own Iron Man stuff, uh, Iron Monger for example. That's where the idea for that came from. The movie for the original movie was Iron Monger. That was during all that Armor Wars stuff, and that's when the Silver Centurion armor made its debut. And uh, that's always been my favorite suit of armor. So I've got the full run of uh, Leighton's Iron Man bucks with the Silver Centurion armor. Like you know that 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 part of the run is at least complete. I'm I'm trying to get uh, the entirety of Bob Leighton's career in Iron Man. I That'd still really cool. a few, but uh, yeah, the Silver Centurion armor, the whole Armor Wars saga, that was that was always that's always really stood out to me because I just love those designs. Um, so. You know, you talk about the, that being one of your favorite story arcs. Um, Iron Man was also a character that was used to kind of go in directions that, for the time, we didn't really uh, go into those directions uh, in comic books. And one of the most infamous uh, Iron well, Man yeah. story arcs is Demon in a Bottle. Um, yep. What are your thoughts as someone who really is drawn to Iron Man on that story arc? Because I know some people love it. But I also know some people who are Iron Man fans just think maybe it goes a little too far. What's your opinion? <laughs> well, it, 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 it's an interesting tell when you're talking to somebody about their fandom because a lot of people, they just, 
they seem to gravitate to these characters that are infallible. And the thing about Demon in a Bottle is that it, it represents a fallibility that a common person can really relate to. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and it makes the character more substantive and you kind of you kind of get more of a longing, you know. You you really understand and can get into that character's headspace. So, for the time, yeah, it's definitely bold doing it in, a, in what was basically a children's book. You know, at least in Western audiences, consider comics for the most part still be a kids thing. But um, definitely, you know, it dealt with a serious topic. It dealt with it in a realistic way, and it kind of gave you. The, you know, the whole idea of an anti-hero wasn't really popular at the time. But it almost made Stark kind of into that, that idea of an anti-hero because he was fallible. He did make mistakes. And that's something that's lacking from a lot of pop culture today is you've got these, uh, I guess they call them Mary Sue's or whatever, but these, you know, t- these character types that nothing goes wrong for, everything comes easy, and they come off as cardboard. You know, I can't relate. Nobody can relate to that. Right. But, uh, you know, and, and, and Stark throughout the Iron Man line, not just uh, with the alcoholism, but also dealing with, uh, you know, the reconstructive surgery on his chest at some point. Um, not, you know, him, him being completely disabled again in a wheelchair and only able to walk around in the suit for quite a while. Uh, you know, there was a lot of vulnerabilities to that character. That uh, it made him extraordinarily relatable. Absolutely. And you just, you know, that's one of those that you did, and you, good writing makes that. Um. So, obviously, Iron Man has become an icon in the world of comics, movies, and pop culture because of Robert Downey Jr.'s portrayal of that character through three individual movies. Uh, four Avengers movies and then even, you know, playing a major role in a Captain America movie. So, Mm -hmm. you know, there's a, uh, as someone who really took to Iron Man as one of your favorites, uh, what was your opinion of all the Iron Man movies, RDJ, RDJ's portrayal, you know, so many people love Iron Man now because of RDJ. You were kind of on the Iron Man train before it was cool. Mm-hmm. How do you feel about all that? With uh, Robert Downey Jr., I think it's an excellent, excellent casting. He's he owns the role of Tony Stark. His life as a celebrity mirrors the, the life of Tony Stark, and he looks like the, I mean, how yeah, oh yeah, that, you know, it, it's 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 an example of perfect casting. Absolutely. Um, do you feel that the movies, the Iron Man movies, were? Uh, on par with the book, so to speak. Like, I, I'm i not trying to be one of those comic fans. Like, if you did not, you know, you may think this is good, but the book, I mean, the book, it's just how much better. I'm not trying to be that guy. But, <laughs> you know, I also, uh, personally, Iron Man 1, to me, was one of the best of all time, and then a few of the other subsequent uh, Iron Man movies uh, were not some of my favorites in the MCU. Yeah, no. Uh, but it, what do you? How do you feel about you know the the different Iron Man movies? I, I I totally agree with you on Iron Man one being pretty much the perfect comic book movie, and it was also this. You know, we'd had the you know the Incredible Hulk TV show was probably the best thing going for Marvel in live action up until the Iron Man movie, right? Because we had really hadn't superheroes hadn't made it to the big screen yet, and seeing Iron Man the way it's portrayed, the armor. Uh, it, you know, it just it made a kid's dream come true to see this come to life. Uh, after Iron Man 1, I think it just, they put too much emphasis on using Iron Man to buffer the story that they were building largely for the whole MCU. And so they, they had some real missed opportunities. I would have loved to have seen Titanium Man and Crimson Dynamo. Uh, Whiplash was always a lame-ass character in the comics to me. So I didn't really care. It's like, why are we doing Whiplash? Come on, there's so much better material to pull from, villain-wise, than Whiplash for number two. Uh, number two was so. Number two was okay, and then number three was. Number three, I absolutely hate. Okay. Uh, I hate it because they ruined Mandarin, ruined a chance to do Mandarin right. Uh, but well, oh, it's not really the Mandarin; it's just some Hollywood actor. Blah blah blah. We never got into the uh, you know the the. the um, 
the the Ten Rings, never went any further than that. Then there was this whole sequence of, let's put as many suits in the screen as we can with this really ridiculous thing. And my favorite armor gets the chintz treatment, you know, the Silver Centurion armor. So that's like the only Iron Man hot toy I own is the Silver Centurion one. And uh, you got like 20, less than 20 seconds of screen time or something. So... Okay. Uh, there, there, there were lots of mistakes made, and, and it's just uh, there was so much more to that character, and the first movie did it so well that I don't think there's any way a Hollywood writing team could could outdo the first movie. It's just not in their wheelhouse to make better a sequel better than the first one. So. Okay, I feel I feel a little bit better about my feelings on. Uh, Iron Man 3, now that you've kind of said that, because that was the first time I ever left a movie theater feeling disappointed. I've seen some bad comic book movies, but I could walk out going, that was neat, that was fun. Oh, well, hey, at least I got to see this. And yeah, at least yeah. Venom was in Spider-Man 3, and he looked cool. At least Green Lantern had some cool effects. And then I walked out of Iron Man 3, which was objectively a better movie than those two, going, what did they do yeah. to the Mandarin? What the I, actual Iron fuck? Man 2's highlight, Iron Man 2's highlight was War Machine. Right, and and Big even War Machine action, and that kind of—it's funny you mention that because I remember kind of comparing the two with some friends of mine. I said, you know, Iron Man three was like a better movie than Iron Man two, but I didn't walk out feeling disappointed because they didn't have this whole really cool. I didn't see this cool trailer about he's going through PTSD, and here's the Mandarin as this like ridiculous terrorist. Where I'm like, oh god, they're going dark with Iron Man. This is this is a new take. This is great, and then it ends up just being a joke. And I'm like. Okay, that's kind of dumb. Whereas Iron Man 2, yeah. I'm like, Mickey Rourke, Iron Man, <laughs> War Machine, gonna have a good time. Yeah, no, the, yeah, the, whole, uh, break, the whole breaking of the Mandarin's character just pulled me out of the escapism altogether. Me too. So. Yes, we're definitely on the same wavelength there. Um, kind of last question about Iron Man. Um, you know, you kind of mentioned they were really trying to build the MCU around Iron Man, and I guess it, it's kind of similar taking this back to wrestling fandom. I get it, you know, when you got a star that big that's as popular as, as he was, you'd be silly not to try and build your universe around something like that. You know, I'm not... I, I, I'm, I'm not, you know, uh, somebody who's all about, you know, you gotta sacrifice what's gonna make the money for the sake of just the art. I, I understand at the end of the day, you're, it, it is a business. Do you feel that at certain parts of the MCU, they took away from the other Marvel characters um, in order to put on that pedestal RDJ, Iron Man, you know, here, here's the cool, the charismatic cool actor playing the charismatic cool character, and, at, you know, we're going to make sure he gets featured at the expense of... Captain America, or at the expense of Hulk, or at the expense of Black Widow, or something like that. You could, did you kind of get that vibe, or, or not? You know, it's maybe to some extent, but I think you know, being as ambitious for as large of a cast as they've had, I think they did a good job with it. Every every character seemed to get a pretty decent amount of screen time, and you know, there's just I don't I don't see how you could do every every member complete justice when you have such a large cast member, cast ensemble. Um, you know, I, some, of the, some, of the, some of the characters that I'd like to see I haven't seen yet, and some of the uh, stuff that they have done with, with some of the other tertiary characters is kind of, eh, meh. But you're, at the same time, it's like you're at a buffet table and you're complaining that the fried chicken's not as good as you'd like. It's a freaking buffet table. They made a crap ton of food. They're not going to get the one thing that you want right, you know, in that scenario. Right on. Um, so you mentioned, we, we've talked Iron Man. Uh, what other, sticking with Marvel for a little while, what, who are some of the other Marvel characters that you really gravitated towards? Uh, to bring in, uh, to bring in a female, Rogue has always been my favorite, uh, uh, female character in the Marvel universe. We're definitely on the same and, page there. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I, you know, because I, cause I started really heavily collecting during the Jim Lee era of X-Men and just the way that he, he drew her and the fact that she's a Southern Belle and I like the whole white hair thing. So it definitely had a lot of appealing factors for me with, with Rogue. And then you go over to the movies, you get a hint of Rogue in, in one X-Men movie and then the character is just pretty much gone. Um, you know, I, I really want to see 
when they bring X-Men back into the Marvel Universe. I want to see Rogue steal power from Ms. Marvel or Captain Marvel, whatever the heck her name is, and become become that character that I saw in the Jim Wayne comic books. <laughs> that would be cool. Um, I really like Lo- Rogue because I'm a Gambit fan, and that's something I'm still holding out hope for is eventually on in, in a movie we get the Rogue-Gambit relationship. Um, so you, you mentioned Rogue. Uh, did you... Have you ever? Uh, do you have the first appearance of Rogue? Or are you uh, reading yes, any? Yeah. Are, you, are you reading any current comic books? Or are you seeing what they're doing now with mentioning the uh, the Rogue and Gambit relationship? What they've done very recently with uh, the two of them actually getting married and having a a fairly well written uh, series about their marriage and what they and, and uh, being. A, a, X-Men and an Avenger through their marriage. Uh, you been able to check out any of that? No, I actually haven't. I've been very disappointed with current year Marvel. And I haven't bought in a, a, uh, I haven't bought in a mainstream comic book in quite a long time because I've been very focused on independent stuff, doing my own independent book and supporting my friends that are doing, doing their comics. So I think the last mainstream comic that I bought was... Uh, Gail Simone's first issue of Red Sonia, and I thought the writing was so terrible that I just like I just canceled my subscription, and that was the end of my mainstream comic purchases. <laughs> well, if um, I- I'll I'll let you know right here and right now. Definitely check out the Mister and Mrs. X book if you can. If you eventually want to, just check out a trade paperback. Um, when you know when you can. I, I do suggest that one. I'm kind of in the same boat. Uh, Marvel, current Marvel, like, is very hit or miss to me, but to me this one was a very, this was, I don't want to say it was a Grand Slam home run, but some some issues were home runs, and it definitely every issue got on base, so I will say that much. Um, yeah, no, it makes, it makes sense to me. I mean, there's, there's always going to be some, there's always going to be some gems in there, but... You can see the writing on the wall with Marvel and DC that the comics part is not their main concern. Oh no, uh, anymore, and that you know that leaves that leaves fans lacking. And so, you want to go someplace where you get an idea that the creative team behind the product you're buying actually cares about your opinion about it. Right. And that's what that's been like some of the the greatness of the indies, um, and um, that doesn't mean I still don't buy Marvel books or any other books because. I'm really trying to pad my collection of silver and bronze age and even some golden age stuff too. So it's given me an opportunity to take that money and go back and support past creations, uh, things that I maybe missed out on when I wasn't buying them as a kid. And so I've, I've gotten a fairly, you know, I've been able to get that uh, silver surfer number one. That's one of my favorites in my collection. Uh, I do have the first appearance of red Sony. I got the first appearance in origin of swamp thing. So you know, I can still support characters that I love, even if I can't support them in current year, because, you know, DC, they curly, they've messed up Swamp Thing so bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> so I go back and, again, I try to collect all the old stuff, some of the original, like the original game and writings and all that, and uh, and, and get some of that, that better material. Um, all right, so you mentioned DC, so we're going to going to kind of switch gears a little bit and i i can already since i just said those two letters i know there's going to be a very large section of the listening audience who's just like off now because you mentioned (laughs) you mentioned those two letters you essentially (coughs) turn off a a small section of the fan uh, uh, a a small section a very large section of the fan base for better or worse these days let me let me help you out or maybe i'll make it worse but i hate batman Okay, well, I was going to say, you hate Batman. That's my actual favorite, so I was going to ask if you had any favorite Batmans, but you hate Batman, so... Um, is there anything else from the, the DC uh, universe that you you do like, that you were drawn to, that you did collect, or anything of that I, nature? I always I always loved Green Lantern. He was always Okay, so character. okay, you've redeemed yourself cuz that's like my number 2 <laughs> in DC. So you 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 might have hated the person that I have like half of my house dedicated to, but we're back <laughs> on the same page now with Batman or with Green Lantern. And do you remember the Iron Lantern book when they did that? Amalgam, yes, absolutely. Oh god. Yeah. <laughs> that that was just pure joy for me when that came out. 
Um, all right, so you know, I, th- I, I thought like this episode was lost because I wouldn't be able to go into detail about Batman, which is like the easiest thing in the world for me to do. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, but since you talk about it, I mean, I don't necessarily hate hate. I just think it's, you know, he's like Wolverine in the Marvel Universe. Stop telling me the origin story over and over again. Stop, uh, you know, uh, learn how to write this character so it makes it more interesting again. You know, it's just... Overplayed, overhyped, I guess you could say. I, I can kind of... I, I will say this as someone, again, who... In my living room, I have one bookshelf dedicated to Batman statuettes. Um, in my game room, I have um, a whole wall with Batman figures, uh, autographs from people associated with Batman, and my when i got a real job for the first time in my life you know a lot of people when they do that they put money down on a house or they they get a car i got a 500 dollar um neil adams batman bust uh drawn for me <laughs> that was my present to myself that hey you have an income now and yeah yeah you know that was my my present to myself but um i do kind of agree that you know there is sort of the uh any Batman with prep time kills everybody, and like while I can, I certainly appreciate you know the aspect to that character. You know, like hey, you know if he with enough time to prepare, Batman can find a way to slow anything down. I um, I definitely kind of see where like if someone's likes another hero, they get a little tired of well, Batman's gonna kill that. Oh, you like Green Lantern? Oh, Batman, Batman just you know with with prep time, Batman's gonna use Scarecrow's serum on him and kill him. Oh, with uh fucking. <laughs> Oh, you like Superman? Well, he's he's got kryptonite and he's got magic, and 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 Superman's no match for Batman. Oh, you like you like Iron Man? Um, I'm sure he can. Ha- you know, th- definitely Wayne Enterprises has more money than than Stark Industries, so he's gonna do that. You know, I get a little tired of the Batman fans from that perspective. I do agree with you, but um, is there anything that did redeem Batman? Be it a movie, be it a comic book, be it um, oh, you know what. Batman 89, I still watch that over and over again at once every, you know, year or so. Okay. You know, I saw that as a kid. It totally captivated me. Um, you know, Batman Returns was pretty good. You, you give me another Keaton Batman movie and I'll buy a ticket for it, you know. Right. So I guess you were not a big fan of the Nolan series or just maybe didn't like it as much as the Keaton movies? Uh, Nolan was, the, 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 the one with Joker, The Dark Knight, that one was good. But that's because Heath Ledger really carried that movie, and I've never really cared for Christian Bale in the in the role, uh, especially the voice that he makes for him. Yeah, like, thank you. Know. Okay, I love the dark. The Dark Knight is my favorite. That I love that trilogy. But yes, I don't. I don't like my cook. My my uh, my Batman sounding like Cookie Monster with throat cancer yeah, no, choking yeah. on a cigar. The, the, the best Batman. The best you know. The best Batman that's not. The Keaton movie, and maybe that's mostly nostalgia for me, but the Batman the animated series. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, yeah. I can I can rewatch that all the time because that's you know that's that's pretty much perfection. I'm not going to get tired of that first like two or three seasons of that show. Um, and you know you mentioned voices. You know Kevin Conroy was able to oh, yeah. um have a Bruce Wayne voice and a Batman voice without sounding like this. So. Yeah, but definitely. See, that's, the problem. that's the problem for me with Batman. It's like I can go to other platforms and find Batman content I like. I can't find it in the comics. Gotcha. You know? that, that's the fair statement. I, I I will disagree with you somewhat because I have quite a few favorite Batman comics that I feel are are pretty damn fine. But I, I can also kind of see where you're coming from when it's like, I don't need the comic book to get something good out of Batman. Here's a movie that's good. Here's a, a long-running television series that was good. Here's you know, yeah. Hey, you look at the Iron uh, look at the Iron Man cartoon. That's almost unwatchable. Yeah. The one with Uncle Phil from Fresh Prince is uh, War Machine. Uh, I just remember they had such awful CG gimmickry for uh, it was like really bad CG even for the time of when the suit when you get in the suit and launch, and it was that that terrible suit from the late nineties. Right. Ugh. Um, but kind of. Getting back uh, to Green Lantern because this 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 might be <laughs> this might be fun to talk comics there. You know, you did kind of tying everything back. It was um, 
you know, you we we didn't get a good Green Lantern cartoon. Like I didn't hate it, but it wasn't great. You know, the Green Lantern right. movie again, I didn't hate it, but it definitely wasn't something that was gonna challenge the standard being set by by comic book movies at that time through the Dark Knight trilogy and the MCU. So, you, but as Green Lantern fans, you want your Green Lantern fix. You need to go pick up a comic book. And yeah, uh, exactly, exactly. Um, you know the the whole storyline with him becoming, and I'm and I feel bad for being a fan and not remembering the name of the character, but he became that that super villain, uh, Spectre, or not Spectre, um 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 Parallax. Parallax, yeah, yeah. That, he did. That whole, Hal Jordan did become the Spectre, but that's come something completely different for down the road. Right, right, but yeah, right. but yeah, that that whole that whole uh, that whole storytelling with him becoming Parallax, um, that was just really great writing. That's one of the. Uh, the few times I spend a lot of money buying issues so I could keep up with the story and all these different uh, different scenarios. So, you know that that one always that one always stands out to me. And you know, getting all of the uh, the other the other lanterns and all of that and right. the Black Lantern and those were that you know that was that was pretty cool to kind of enlarge that universe. Um, um I, well, I was just gonna mention that you know. Uh... Before the movie came out, Green Lantern kind of became one of the pillars of the comic book industry uh, back in the the late 2000s, mid to late 2000s, when Jeff Johns took over, brought Hal back, uh, brought the different Lanterns back. Uh, what's your, you know, you mentioned the other Lanterns, but like, you know, did you, were you reading those books at that time, or uh, did you read those in trades, or? Um, I read some of the Guy Gardner stuff. Um, I, I bought, uh, I liked Kyle Reiner for quite a while. Kyle, uh, Kyle was my first Lantern because I got into Green Lantern after Hal had already went away. So, like, Kyle's probably, when I found, when I discovered Hal, Hal became number one. But, like, Kyle's definitely number two because of yeah. just him being my first. And then Stuart be number three because of the cartoon, you know. <laughs> um, so, poor guy. Poor guy Gardner. Um <laughs> Uh, Guy Gardner, always, Guy Gardner was always good as like he was added on into other stories. You know, his own like main book probably. You know, it wasn't really that great, but uh, just the, the whole idea of the, the lantern, the lantern, the lantern core. Um, you know, with with exceptions like Kilowog, you know, sometimes was pretty lame. There was like a there was like a lantern that was like an animated duck looking thing, if I remember right. There was some silly stuff. Um, some corn, some cornball stuff in it, but uh, for the most part, you know, just the idea of the ring and the and being able to create stuff with a ring. I mean, that's a that's a cool gimmick to get to get caught up in the fantasy of. Oh no, like that was a, uh, I think part of the appeal of Green Lantern for me personally was, you know, uh, especially with Kyle Rayner. You know, they were having him in the late '90s. You know, Justice League and uh, uh, his own book. You know, doing really cool like stuff, you know, making monsters out of the the uh, the ring, you know, making the monster constructs, and I'm just like, that's that's really cool. I like that. So, um, now, another thing that, you know, if we're going to talk Green Lantern, we, we got to bring it up was, you know, probably the thing that most uh, comic collectors are gra- gravitate to in uh, the Green Lantern lore is the, the team up with Green Arrow. Do you own any of those books, or uh, you know, we ever? I, I I I don't, it's, and that's one of the that's one of the books that's kind of on my bucket list is to go back and get the, uh, you know, like the infamous the death of Speedy and all that because that's another it's another title that really like we were talking about with uh, Demon in the Bottle that really touched on relatable problems mm-hmm. for these characters. Absolutely and definitely. Uh... I keep always thinking, you know, um, if if the first Green Lantern movie would have actually been kind of they didn't if they didn't try to make Hal Jordan Tony Stark, maybe just maybe we could have gotten some sort of crossover that way with uh, with Stephen Amell or something. You know what I mean? But, yeah, something something like that would have been really cool. Uh, and you know, it just like they they it just suffered from such from bad writing and just. They didn't have the, they, you know, and then, you know, we always complain about DC's movies anyway. They just really don't, they don't match up the quality of what they do with their animation for the most part. 
animation or their TV. I will say I do feel that yeah. there there have been in the later part of it, there's been some DC movies that I think I think get kind of unnecessarily hated on because they're DC movies. But you know, again, kind of going back to my baseball analogy, you know, Marvel's hitting hitting home runs and, you know, DC's, you know, getting base hits. So base hits aren't bad, but <laughs> when your opponent's hitting home runs, you're you're not doing very well, you know. Yeah, definitely. Um, because I like I I enjoyed I enjoyed uh, Shazam, but no, you know, everybody kind of wanted had the pre the preconceived notion to shit on Shazam, Shazam because they're like, oh, this is DC, it's gonna suck, you know. Yeah, no, or, Shazam was like such a really great film. I mean, it was a family film. It was fun. Uh, it, it, you know, it told a, a heartwarming story without mm-hmm. taking itself too seriously. I mean, I, I, my gosh, why can't they, why can't they hit that, hit that, that, that chemistry more than once? Right. And then, you know, I, I, I didn't think Batman vs Superman was the greatest thing ever, but like, I did not mind that movie. I thought it had good parts in it. It had stinker parts. It had good parts. But again, it, they got on base. They, you know, they, they hit a pop fly and. Outfielder couldn't catch it, and they they, they made it to first base. That's that's about how I looked at it. Um, so one of the uh, one of the uh, co- uh, pieces of art I bought from you was at the very first Starcast, uh, the death of WCW uh, panel uh, cover, and that was based off of a Spider Man book. So I'd be remiss if I did not ask you about Spider Man before. You know, it, it, throughout the duration of this interview, uh, what were you a Spider-Man fan, or was that just kind of a you know making a cover like that? Was that something that was just kind of like, oh well, I recognize that cover? Uh, no, no, I, I've been a Spider-Man fan for a while. That was my dad's favorite thing to read, so that was pretty much the first thing I was introduced to. I have to say, it's almost a dead tie between him and Batman, who has the best Rogues Gallery. Uh, and with Spider-Man in the comics, it just depends on who's writing it because Absolutely. I want that snarky, you know, the snarky, jovial, uh, you know, the dad jokes, the pun, the puns and all that, you know, I, I want that in my Spider-Man book. And, uh, you know, if that, if that's, if that doesn't come across, then it's, you know, kind of a, kind of a flop on me and, and just, the. The idea of the character being awkward and nerdy, you know, it's, that's, you know, definitely relatable. Mm-hmm. Um, great, great suit design. Um, you know, and that's, that's, that's one of the things that's like uh, always on my list when I'm looking for, looking through uh, back issues and Silver Age books is I want to get, I want to get a lot of those um, older Spider-Man stories. Um, I really loved the Todd McFarlane run when they did the offshoot with just Spider-Man. Um, the very the, the first like, I guess the first like twenty issues of that were really solid. The whole intro story arc with a lizard was absolutely amazing. Um. So who, if you like that, uh, I was going to ask you um, kind of segue, the Spider-Man movies have been kind of all over the place, in my personal opinion. <laughs> um, there's been things that have been phenomenal about every set of Spider-Man movies that are have been. And then there have been things that, again, in my opinion, just completely, completely sucked it up about each set of uh, Spider-Man movies. Uh do you have a set that was your favorite, or do you have a particular Spider-Man <clears throat> movie that you feel like really? I'm I'm I'm, kind of, I'm not counting Spider-Verse, Edge of the Spider-Verse, even though it was phenomenal, just because it wasn't live, you know, live action. But out of the three sets of Spider-Man movies we got, uh, which set was your has been your favorite, and which individual movie has been your favorite? Uh, well, the first one with Tobey Maguire probably was was my favorite again because that's similar to the experience with Iron Man. It's like we haven't really had you know, something of quality ever and finally getting the fan service of getting a, a decent movie. Spider-Man 2 was okay. Spider-Man 3 was absolute crap. Um, <laughs> but we did see Venom. Another... That, that, that's what I walked out of the theater saying. We did see <laughs> Venom. Hey, that looks like Venom and it's cool. Okay. 
I mean, uh, the, the Andrew Garfield one was, let's put out a movie so we don't lose this license. Um, I did think and, Andrew uh, Garfield did an all right job of Spider-Man. I, I, I feel like he did. I, I liked him better than Tobey Maguire. I don't know. That's a country I, I opinion. Think Andrew Garfield was a better Spider-Man. Tobey Maguire was a better Peter Parker. That's fair. That's, a, that's fair. And the home, the homecoming stuff uh, so far has been has been has been fine. I, you know, there's some there's some tweaks to bring it up to current century that I'm you know yeah, but uh, you know I thought Michael Keaton made a great vulture, mm-hmm. uh, you know and and uh, I'm I'm brain farting on that act, the new actor's name, but you know I thought he was great at the end of the Avengers movie. Yeah, um, I like I like I like in the new movies I like the, him, but I don't. Um... I'm not saying the supporting cast is bad. I'm just saying I don't. It just to me, Spider-Man feels more street level, and I don't feel very street level with the MCU Spider-Man. I feel like it's no, it, it's it's serving the larger narrative. So right. it's it's suffering from the same thing that the subsequent Iron Man's did, and and and, and be honest, most of the uh, most of the other Marvel Marvel movies suffer to some degree because they have to serve this larger narrative. Right. You get, you get and you get a few highlights like Winter Soldier is a badass movie on its own. Right. You know, uh, and I and I'm I'm looking forward to the Black Widow movie. I love Scarlett Johansson as Black Widow. That's another character I'm a mark for, and I think the Black Widow movie, for at least from the trailer, isn't going to be disappointing because it's going to be a good movie. It looks like it's going to be a good movie without it having to be a good Marvel MCU movie. Gotcha. Well, um, let's talk Black Widow for a little bit. Um, do you own any of the uh, any key Black Widow uh, issues, and uh, how do you feel that uh, they use Black Widow in the MCU compared to the comic books? Um, I love Black Widow in the MCU. Uh, you know, I'm also a mark for Scarlett Johansson, so that's probably biasing myself a little bit. Uh, but. Uh, no, it's it's uh it's uh, she's been a, the the most consistent supporting character. You know, we saw her in the original Iron Man movie, uh, and then uh, just her her character's always been there throughout. The only thing I didn't like is when they made her blonde. Right. <laughs> I was like, you didn't. Uh, no, change the you know. I was like, I'm gonna re-edit this movie and recolor her hair just so it's enjoyable. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because um. I know some of my friends are like big Black Widow fans, and I don't, I don't dislike Black Widow, but like throughout the course of the MCU, I'm just kind of like, uh, I have the whole, uh, I don't trust her, I don't trust her, I don't trust her. She's gonna do, <laughs> she's gonna do something. I don't trust her. And then, well, they certainly with 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 making her past as ambiguous as it was, they did give you some reasonable doubt at some point. So absolutely. But then when she, because uh, I'm a, I'm a Hawkeye fan, just through the. Uh, uh, through the uh, Matt Fraction uh, Hawkeye book, but that's uh, another debate for another time. Uh, whenever they <laughs> had that moment with Hawkeye where she sacrificed, I'm like, oh, I can trust her. I don't have any doubt about I can go back and rewatch the movies and not dislike <laughs> her anymore. Okay. I mean, she died, but now I like her. Huh. It was like a really weird feeling to have in the theater. It's like, wow, I feel really terrible she died, but in a way now I'm happy because I like her. Huh. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that was uh, that was the only that was the only gut punch I had for uh, for the end of the uh, the Avengers Endgame was, was not was even when Tony better. died. That was that was that was a great way to go out, though. You know, that was a really okay. great way for him to go out. Um, so I it didn't break my heart as much, but with like Black Widow again, it's like we didn't. I didn't know that we were gonna get a Black Widow movie, so I was like, I'm never gonna see Scarlett Johansson in that outfit again. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's it's funny. I got like the Black Widow, um, the Marvel Legends, uh, Black Widow, Hawkeye, uh, two pack set from uh, I believe it was a Target exclusive, and um, the way I have them posed on the my shelf with all of them is I have the both of them looking over the like all the other ones are posed looking badass. The two of them are looking at the other way with the holding hands, looking down over like the big tall <laughs> shelf it's on. So yeah, that's how much I appreciated that scene. Um, uh, so we mentioned X Men uh, when talking about Rogue, and there's a lot of other uh, 
uh, X Men influenced uh, wrestling artwork you've done, uh, other than Rogue, who are some of the X Men that you were uh, attached to, and what are some of the books that you really through the through the Jim Lee run or before or after? What sort of X Men stuff uh, really influenced you, or in, you really enjoyed? I picked up a lot of the X-Men classic books when I was a young kid buying. And so that introduced me to some of the older stories. I really, like another character that I've always enjoyed was Colossus. Um, yeah, I, I thought he was, I thought he was, he was really, really great. Um, yeah, Archangel. Right. Uh, really great design work. Really, really cool, interesting looking character there. Um the whole uh, extinct, uh, let's say not extinction agenda, but the um, uh, Days of Future Past storyline. Right. Um, I really thoroughly enjoy that. And then, of course, you know the X Men cartoon. You can't uh, yep. <laughs> can't mention X Men without talking about like one, at least one of the top five of all time comic book cartoons. <laughs> my ringtone on my phone is that. Oh yeah. Yeah. Gosh, um, that, that intro just gets you jazzed up. Oh it's yeah. Like, <laughs> well, it's funny you mention the X Men cartoon from the nineties. I mean, that that was my introduction to the. It, it was Fox Kids lineup is what made me introduce me to Batman, Spider Man, and the X Men. That is what got yeah. me down the rabbit hole of comic books to where I'm like, I know these people, but who's that guy? And then tapers off in DC, like, oh, that's Green Lantern, that's Flash, that's you know, that's Spider Man, but who's that guy? Well, that's Iron Man, that's the Hulk, you know. Um, I have a lot of uh, friends that maybe don't have the nostalgia um, to the 90s cartoon, and they we, we've debated time and time again, you know, they, they think that the TV show from the 90s was overrated, or they think that it uh, n- does not hold any merit uh, compared to things like Wolverine and the X-Men and, uh, you know, what have you since then. Do you agree with that perspective objectively or with both of us as our uh, nostalgia goggles on uh, way too much to to see something like that with uh, the 90s X-Men? How do you feel it holds up today? You know, I am very I'm, – I'm bad at, 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 at discerning exactly how much my nostalgia is tainting things. Uh I, I will say going back and watching some of my older my older cartoons, being an adult, uh, I noticed the mistakes that I probably didn't notice when I was a kid. You know, when one person would be talking, but it's another, it's the wrong voice, or there's two star star screams on on the same time. And you know, in the X Men cartoon, there's a, a few flubs here and there. But as far as as far as I can imagine, I I don't think it's nostalgia telling me that. Uh, you know, the stuff that we had when we were growing up was better than what they have now, you know? Right. I think I'm being pretty objective there because the writing, modern cartoon writing is just, uh, it's soft, it's weak. It doesn't deal with any really hard issues. The characters are always like, I don't know, written for insane people. I, you know, look at some of the stuff on Cartoon Network, like Steven Universe and uh, some of the other stuff. It's just, it's just like, this was made for a kid with ADHD who's just eating a bowl of sugar. <laughs> you know, there's no real story here. There's no compelling characters. There's nothing that makes me, that draws me in. And you know, maybe I'm just too old for it, or I don't know. But I really think that, you know, through the '80s and '90s, that was like the the cream of the crop. Right. Um. I guess and it kind of hurts me to say I can see how maybe the animation and you know the look of the characters, maybe possibly it's not as good as it would be today. (laughs) But but, but, but I'm kind of with you as far as the storytelling is concerned. It's like, you know, I thought Wolverine and the X-Men was a good show, but like, you didn't, you know, I really, especially for a show in the 90s, like, you really got the sense of like, holy cow, these are, these are people being oppressed. This is like, you know, Beast is in jail. The judge, yeah. you know, he, he's trying to defend himself and the judge is looking at his watch. And I'm like, what in the, the hell is, and then I'm watching these new ones and there's cool action. There's great voice acting. There's, you know, much, much cleaner animation, but I'm like, I don't feel the whole, like, wow, these are, these are corrupt politicians trying to, you know, 
legally eradicate a group of of, of human beings from the earth, you know? Exactly, uh, exactly. And and that's one of the reasons why like anime and manga appeals to me more than most stuff in Western audiences is because it's story driven, it's character development. It's not just boobs and explosions like everything over here it seems is like it's bright flashy lights, it's you know yeah, it's it's cheap entertainment for the most part and gimmicky over here over there I'm, i find myself like tearing up because an animated character is dying on screen or is professing their uh un undying devotion to their friends and putting their life in danger to save their you know there's there's stuff like that that's this is not here anymore they, they don't tell those stories here in western audiences and you know it, Style, the technology involved in creating it. Yeah, you can, you can, you can go back and forth and talk about, um, you know, what maybe it looks something looks better, but again, that's just caving into a uh, a narcissistic type of society that only cares about what the outside is. There's no substance underneath. To me, that's worthless. So, you know, just like in comic books, like. Um, good art is not going to carry a bad story, but a bad, but a good writing can carry bad art. I, it feels really good to hear you say that as an artist, because I got, again, kind of, there's going to be some of my friends listening to me who's like, he's talking about me, and I kind of am, and I'm sorry, but, um, uh, I have some <laughs> friends who are artists, or, you know, at least took art classes, you know, they're, they're not professional, but they, you know, they dabble, and, um, they are very much, and I'm not saying, I'm not saying they're wrong about this. I'm just saying it's not what I do. I can't read a book just for the art. I mean, there are sometimes I've picked a book up and I've been like, here's some good art, but like, I feel empty at the end of reading it. Um, but I've never been able to go like, well, the art was so bad, I couldn't get past the bad art to read the good story. But there right. have been times where I'm like, and I'm I'm just gonna play because this is my least favorite book of all time, All Star Batman and Robin by Frank Miller and Jim Lee, which I thought would have been the best thing ever because you got arguably the best Batman writer ever, Frank Miller, and you have arguably the best Batman artist ever, Jim Lee. So I remember picking that up and going, "This is gonna be great," you know. You got the the dark grittiness of a Frank Miller, and you got the clean, beautiful art style of Jim Lee, and I'm hearing like, "This is a joke, right?" Like this is. This is a joke. This is this is terrible. What the hell? What were you smoking, Frank? And then, <laughs> you know, and then subsequently hearing like, oh, it's a parody. No, it's not a parody. He's just trying to deconstruct and hearing all the different arguments. But I'm like, the beautiful art did not carry to me what was just kind of like an idiotic story. But right. my artist friends are like, no, look at the detail. This is so cool. You know, this is look at how. Robin kicks Green Lantern's ass, you know, and the detail and how he's kicking Green Lantern's ass. It's great, you know. Um, but I think it's really interesting to hear you say that as an artist, because most of my artist friends there, the art drives the story more, so. Yeah, no, sorry. Uh, I, hate to break, I hate to break it to him, but uh, unless you're the type of person who can, you know, and that's why it's primarily probably coming from your artist friends is because they can, they can, they can uh, extract a degree of enjoyment from the visual that is going to, I guess, in their minds, make up for the narrative because they're not really going they're, they're I guess they're pre-biased because they're going into it looking for the great visuals instead of going into it looking for a narrative. See, if I'm going to read a comic as an artist, I'm spending time doing something that I'm not generating income or helping my family with. This is leisure time. So, I need to come away from that feeling like I didn't waste that leisure time. And if it's just all visuals and there's no substance, I'm just going to, you know, I'm just going to turn it off. Like I watched uh, Wonder Woman 84. Halfway through it, I was just like, well, I got something else to do. So I just turned it off. And I went back and finished it like two or three hours later. I didn't miss anything. <laughs> right. You know, and I, I, what, I, what I'll say for that movie is that the last 45 minutes of it was better than the rest of it. <laughs> right. Like, you could edit out, because that movie was long, too, and it suffers from bad editing. You could edit out almost an hour of footage and probably put together something that's a lot better of a compelling story than what we did get. Um, 
But you know, it, yeah, don't want to get off on too many rabbit trails. But oh no, uh, this is good because this is you know <laughs> I'm 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 actually I'm learning a few things from a different perspective, so I like this. But there are a few more things I did want to ask you about. Um, the one. Last from the world of uh, American comics, I guess I should say I wanted to ask you about, is um, because I, I talked about in the big centerpiece of uh, quite a bit of my collection is your your piece with the Four Horsemen uh, in wrestling as the Fantastic Four. So I'd be, I have to also ask about the Fantastic Four. Did you read the Fantastic Four, favorite stories? Do you have a favorite member of the Fantastic Four? Take me through... Uh, you know, kind of the, the beginning of the Marvel Age, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> characters there. Uh, you have any uh, connection with them? Not real solid connection. Uh, mostly more more along the key books. Um, I do have a couple of issues with the introduction of the Silver Surfer, which I was really a big fan of Silver Surfer. Uh, so I think for, for the most part, Fantastic Four introduced me to some other stuff that I liked. Um, as a vehicle, not necessarily as a standalone. I think the older Silver Age stuff was written really well. I don't like, I don't like youthing them up. Like the, the movies that came out, they were just like, eh. you know. I, I think I think with the possibility of John Krasinski being, I think he is going to be Reed Richards. I think he's going to do a re- good job. Oh yeah, he'd be great. Um, yeah. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. Jessica Alba, she looks great, but she's not the best actor, so she doesn't make a really good Sue Storm. And those two were always more of like a parenting influence in the, in, the, in, in the classic sense of the book. So they need to recapture that, you know. They need to be like the, the elder parents in mentality uh, driving the story, whereas, like, you know, Johnny Storm is going to be the hothead and Thing is going to be the big, the big grump of the group, uh, so to speak. I, I think if they have that, 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 keep that kind of demographic in, in the storytelling, I think the new Fantastic Four will redeem the uh, the stuff we had from Sony in the past. Yeah, that's <laughs> the, you know we talked about Spidey earlier, and we're like you know I I can go to the Sony movies and be like, hey, the tone worked. You know, I I like the tone of the the Raimi fi- films because uh, well, this feels like Spider Man to me. And then you know they get to the the next room like Andrew Garfield's really good as Spider-Man. Like, he is really good. And then the MCU, it's like, but so is this guy, you know? And, and, and you know, we, we have, you know, good characterization with the villains. And then, like, I, I, I just look at the Fantastic Four and I'm like, oh, this is bad all around. There's nothing <laughs> There's nothing good about any of these. <laughs> like... It's not getting any better. Exactly. Um... Where's where's the uh, John Carpenter one when I need it? <laughs> um, so we we you know, we talked about anime and manga, and I know that uh, that's a huge huge influence on you uh, through your art style. Um, yep. How did you first discover the genre of of Japanese anime? Because there was. For me personally, there were so many shows that I didn't realize that's what I was watching. I'm just like, hey, here's another cartoon, and the characters look different. It wasn't until I became a little older, I'm like, oh, that's Japanese. Okay, cool, you know? Yeah, well, yeah, because a lot of the stuff that we grew up with was animated with Japanese uh, animation. Uh, Transformers, you know, that whole style, Thundercats, um, all that stuff came from uh, the uh, Japanese influences of the time. As far as actual Japanese content, though, um, that goes back to Captain Harlock. Oh, I'm uh, actually not familiar with this. Oh my gosh! You, you look up Arcadia in My Life, uh, Captain Harlock. The Netflix uh, CG movie is actually really good um, to bring it into a modern audience. But so, being a kid, all I had was VHS stores to go rent, and I was like renting like tons of stuff during the summer. You know, I'd go rent Wonderful World of Disney videos, go rent Black Hole again. Uh, and then I, it, at one point in time, I picked up this video of Captain Harlock. And it was just like a VHS compilation of a whole bunch of episodes. And I was just engrossed by this. He's a space pirate. Um, it's just like, it's just really good storytelling. And it just, uh, and I love the look of the character. Um, that got me into, there's like a whole offshoot universe around that character, Galley Express 3-9. 
Uh, then getting into Robotech and finding out that it was actually just a chopped up Macross and going and watching the original Macross stuff. Um, there's a really neat streaming channel called uh, Retro Crush that has a lot of the older um, anime stuff. Uh, so I kind of stuck with that and would just rent from a VHS store once in a while, something that I thought I might look at and like. Fist of the North Star, Venus Wars, of course Akira, Ghost in the Shell, some of those old classic stuff. And then Cartoon Network started raiding with Toonami, and they had a show called Big O that really... Oh, really shit! Me. Yes! Really reeled me in. Oh, th this one... Oh, it, it's... Okay, you just kind of helped me segue, because I was getting ready to say, um, you know, I kind of, I'd watch, you know, just because they were on, you know, there was uh, stuff like Speed Racer, Sailor Moon. Um, Dragon Ball, all the Dragon Yeah, Ball all, stuff. all that stuff. And then, um, you know, I hear about, I get into Pokemon, and, you know, my family's like, yeah, that's that's Japanese animation, like all this stuff. And that's when I'm like, oh, okay. Well, then Toonami comes around, and at first I'm kind of like, I don't know if all these are for me, you know, like I'm seeing Dragon Ball Z and all this, this good stuff. And, but the, the Superman, the animated series was on there. I'm like, well, I still like that show. So I would turn on Toonami to watch Superman. And then one day I, I, I said like, eh, I'll sit through some of the other stuff. And the first thing they had on there was right before Superman was Dragon Ball Z. And I'm like, heck yeah, this is awesome. And then after <laughs> Superman was Big O and I got into Big O, um, which I feel is a very underrated anime. So just because oh, I don't yeah. know when I'll ever talk about Big O again, let's let's talk Big O. Uh, what what drew you to this very interesting sort of uh, story? Very interesting sort of anime. What drew you into Big O? I'm I'm not gonna give it any nice looting answer. It's a big ass robot breaking stuff. Come on, man. Okay, <laughs> that's fair enough. Um, uh, no, it's a great it's great storytelling. They give you this mysterious universe. Everybody has amnesia. They don't know why life is the way it is. Uh, so there's just so many like mysteries and clues that you try to pick up through the story to try to put, piece this puzzle together. Uh, Dorothy finding out that she's an android mm -hmm. uh, that's like imbued with the spirit of this dead guy's daughter and uh, <laughs> just unraveling mystery after mystery. I mean, I I don't think he even remembers how he has the robot if i right. recall it's been yeah. a while since i've seen the series but um yeah and you know the city's encased in a dome and <laughs> just... somewhat somewhat topical for what could be happening soon with us yes yeah yeah um... yeah, yeah but the whole kaiju aspect of it i mean that's 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 just a lot of fun and that there's also you know there's the, the universe feels like Batman the animated series. It's got this dark noir to it. Uh, I love noir stuff, so that 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 brings me in. And then uh, um, the steampunk design of the of, of Big O himself. I mean, yeah. it's just it's fun. It's just fun. I know uh, it did, and I'm kind of with you. And I mentioned you. Know, yeah, I did feel very Batman the animated series with a robot. I think they, I think even when the show made the transition to Adult Swim. Um, they kind of, in the bumpers, teased about that. But uh, one thing I, I, I personally really was attracted to Big O, like, because the, I don't want to say it was the first time they aired it whenever I discovered it, but they just so happened to be playing the first episode that day. And I'm seeing, other than the robot, like, I'm still seeing Roger, and he's driving around, like, what's essentially a Cadillac. And yeah. then he gets done, you know, and he's like, oh, he's so cool, you know, he's so, uh, you know, way he's negotiating this whole hostage situation. He's driving this cool car, and then he immediately goes, and he... And this is on Saturday afternoon after school. He goes to a bar to talk to an informant, and he's drinking a beer, and he, you know, he goes back to his fancy house, and he's, you know, pouring him a scotch, and he's talking, you know, and he's being all nonchalant about everything. You know, he, I'm like, this is an after school. I'm 10, 11 years old at this time, and... <laughs> I'm like, here's a guy drinking a beer and drinking a scotch after work, and like, <laughs> can you be any cooler than that? That's the best. I know. It's, it, it, there's a, there's an element of James Bond to it. Uh, it's just you know, it hits on so many little levels. A absolutely. Um, uh, much as I love Big O, though, um, there are a uh, a couple. 
couple that kind of outrank Big O, if you will. Um, and we mentioned Dragon Ball. Were you ever a Dragon Ball fan? Dragon Ball Z? Did you get into that or off and on? I'm not not a long term fan of it. Uh, I watched pretty much all of Dragon Ball Z when it was out. Um, it's one that I'll that I'll that I'll watch if I don't have anything else, you know, that I'm really getting to watch. I'll be I'm fine watching Dragon Ball, but I guess I was just never a hardcore fan of it. Gotcha. Um, so we talk about Toonami, and then from the popularity of Toonami, which, you know, yeah, we did have Roger Smith, um, you know, drinking alcohol after, <laughs> after work, but, um, you know, they still kind of toned down a significant amount of violence that was on all of those, um, the anime series they were playing. But the yeah. popularity from that eventually leads to, at the time, the Adult Swim anime block. Nope. And that's where we get so many Gundam uh, Wing. It's like there's Gundam, um, Yu Yu Hakusho, and then what ended up becoming my favorite anime of all time, Cowboy Bebop. Oh, um, Cowboy Bebop is great. Um, so let, let's let's like talk about what came with um through Adult Swim. You know, you mentioned Gundam. Uh, that is really a deep series. Uh, especially even some of the older ep- the series, you know, from the 70s and early 80s, there's a lot of deep themes you wouldn't expect to see from, I know it's Japanese anime, but any sort of animated feature. Um, What's your thoughts on Gundam? I absolutely love Gundam. I've seen pretty much, I haven't seen Gundam uh, Gundam Thunderbolt yet. Uh, Gundam Wing is my all-time favorite. Uh, Those are my favorite Gundams, favorite designs. Death Scythe is my absolute favorite of among those. Uh, great characters. Uh, Gundam Zero Zero is a, is number two for me. It's kind of like a spiritual sequel to Gundam Wing in a way. The storyline's kind of similar. There really isn't a um, a, co- a cohesive Gundam universe locking all, all Gundam stuff together. Uh, you've got a few different uh, pockets of right. that. Um, and then another really good one that's brand new, well, pretty brand new, I think it came out a year or two ago, was uh, Gundam Origins. And it follows, it, it starts like the very, very beginnings of the Gundam saga. And uh, you, you, you see that just kind of coming up from the very beginning. And that, that's, that's really good, too. Uh, one of the things that I like about it, and the reason why I can't get my wife to watch any of it, is she gets really bored with the political intrigue and drama, and I just right. eat that crap up. <laughs> See, I'm kind of, I'm of two minds about political stuff. Like, sometimes, you know, like, it does, it, it, it can be used to serve a, a story well, in the case of Gundam, but there are times I'm just kind of like, um, I, I see this. I see this for the other 20 hours of the day. I, I, <laughs> I, want, I want this last part of my day to be, you know, not about that, but, you know, you mentioned the political, like, even the early, the mobile suit Gundam, you know, you have the Earth Federation at war with uh, the Principality of Zeon, and, you know, you're having, like, themes of, like, okay, yeah, obviously the, you know, Principality of Zeon, you know, they want to be independent, which, yay, but they're going about, you know, essentially terrorist attacks to do it. Well, that's not good, but the Earth Federation is going to fight them, so yay, but they're also hurting other people that want their independence that are just innocent people. And you're like, oh, there's so many times watching that, like, I'm, I'm watching. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's so many groups to follow. That's one of the reasons why she doesn't really get into it, because she gets lost. Like, wait, wait, are these the bad guys? No, wait, are these the bad guys? <laughs> like, right. <laughs> and, um, you know, again, it's kind of one of those, like, uh, you know, you get, okay, hey, uh, Amaro did something really cool for the Earth Federation, yay! But we're gonna end it with like a bunch of people from Zeon who lost their house and all they want to do is just you know live their <laughs> life. And you're like, oh, and then uh, you know it touches on themes of you know yes, you know it's cool to be cool to like country, it's cool to enjoy living there, but you know maybe not everything your government does is good, you yep. know. <laughs> um, so those are some really for things that were essentially created in the late seventies, early eighties. That's some deep, deep, deep stuff. I mean, I know like nowadays it's commonplace, but that's not uh, something at least on mainstream animation. You get it in the comic books, but any sort of mainstream animation, you didn't really see something like that. 
Yeah, well, I, uh, that comes back to uh, Western versus Eastern. See, in, uh, in, in Japan, manga and anime, that is their medium of expression. That's gotcha. their, and, and that, that's for that's for adults. That's for that's everything. That's their main medium of. They they do TV and movies too, but and and, and all that. But for like their their cultural identity, it's anime and manga. Whereas over here, we tend to take anything animated. And say, oh, that's just for kids. Right. So when we see these adult themes coming up in comics and, and animation, being a uh, an American, that takes us by surprise because we don't. We're not pre-programmed with a bias that oh wait this shouldn't be for you know kids or whatnot, and that's not part of Japanese culture at all. It's you know. Gotcha. Oh, didn't even know that. Okay. Um, always a great podcast when I can learn something at the end of it. So, um, <laughs> gotta talk Bebop. Um, my opinion, greatest anime of all time. Uh, love it. Uh, met Steve Bloom, played Spike. Uh, great guy. Uh, what drew you into a very, very special type of program such as Cowboy Bebop? Well, with Cowboy Bebop, you get the you, you get that that the noir, the darkness, the uh, a little bit of steampunk here and there, the the great storytelling. It's just you know, it it, it hits all the hallmarks of of something that's you know, would definitely appeal to me. Um, I, you know, it's, it's just one of, it's one of those things. It's like when, 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 when they're telling a good story, like, I love the fact that they hurt, they don't realize that what Ian is, you know, the, the data, the data dog, you know, the, the, yeah. the, the, yeah. the still, he's just, you know, he's just a dog that's there, you know, it's like, uh, yeah. but, but the audience members know the back, what's going on there. So, you know, you get that little, uh, you know, they don't, they don't get it. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you have a particular favorite episode of Cowboy Bebop? Because unlike a lot of the other series we've talked about that span forever and Dragon Ball Z, you know, with about a thousand episodes of film. I love DBZ before all you, well, every Dragon Ball Z fan comes after me. I love Dragon Ball Z, but um, well, lots of filler. Uh, this very... I, I, love, go ahead. I love learning about Faye's backstory, why she's so good at poker. Uh, but there was like a, that standalone episode where it was uh, some mysterious blob in their refrigerator comes to life and starts like knocking them out and it's stalking them through the through the ship. Really? Yeah. I mean, that was just like a that was just such a cool, creepy standalone episode. It it was cool. I just kind of like one of those like it felt so off from the rest and everything else because like I'm not saying it was a bad episode. Don't get me wrong. But it was just one of those like. Everything else, like it, as realistic as it can be, everything that happens in Cowboy Bebop feels based in reality. Like, hey, maybe in twenty, I don't want to put a standard on anything because you never, you never know. I mean, we thought we were going to be having flying cars by twenty twenty one, but you know, hey, yeah, maybe, by t- maybe by twenty seventy one we will be colonizing other planets. And you know, you like, there's kind of that whole like, okay, it's futuristic, but it's still reality. They don't have like. You know, they aren't, yeah. they aren't teleporting, they're not, you know, right. uh, setting phasers or anything like that. You know, they have straight up, they're flying through ships, but they have missiles on the ships, and they have guns, and it's all yep. that kind of yep. stuff. But then when this episode comes around, it's very like, okay, here's the one thing that absolutely cannot and will not happen, even in the future, is the mold coming to life and killing people, unless it's supposed to <laughs> represent something else, um, which there's probably about a thousand fan theories on what that's supposed to represent instead of uh, the actual blob coming to life, but it's interesting to hear you say that because that, that's one that a lot of the the diehard Bebop fans, you know, really kind of dislike. I don't dislike, it's just not my favorite, but it's really cool that it, it shows that there is an episode for everyone and that everybody every episode could be someone's favorite because, yeah, that's... Sure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so through... How did you discover manga? Uh, through this, and what are some of the uh, manga titles you recommend? Uh, well, with my, um, manga is basically about, you know, I like this anime, I want to know more about these characters, I want to read ahead, uh, you know, and so that's just kind of the way, that's kind of the way it goes. 
it's it's difficult learning to read um, the opposite way. Right. I still, I still get tripped up sometimes because if you get genuine manga, it's not left to right like we do. It's right to left. You're basically starting from the back of the book, going forward. You're starting at the bottom of the page and working your way up. So it's completely different um, reading style. Uh, there's uh, just you know if you, if there's an anime you like, find the manga because you're going to get deeper into the lore, deeper into the characters. Um, some of my favorite, more contemporary um, animes are manga that uh, I like to read, like Soul Eater, Fairy Tale. Uh, the the original source material for Berserk is really great. Check that out. Um, just some amazing, uh, amazing art, amazing storytelling. Um, just uh, you know, I, I really couldn't pin it down to, to like one specific or one or two specific things, but. You know, just the, the series that I really enjoy, I always try to look track down the manga. Um, there's one that's on, uh, if you like stuff that's dark, uh, you know, check out Doro de Horo on, uh, on uh, Netflix. Okay. And the original manga for that is, is like, really, like, this is um, Hieronymus Bosch-type illustration creepy stuff. So. Gotcha. Um. <laughs> uh, it's definitely not for everybody, but it's, you know... It's one of those things where you're seeing something where someone's taking a huge risk uh, to uh, to go in a certain direction, and uh, I think it pays off. Um, on the flip side of that, was has there ever been a time you were at a convention or at a bookstore, and you see the shelves and you see a manga, and you're like, oh, hey, and then you just pick that one up, and then subsequently that either makes you, A, want to keep reading the manga or be is there an anime for this oh there is cool let me watch this now is there anything where it kind of worked in the opposite direction so to speak well there's one right now that i'm hoping gets its own animated series um it's basically uh i gotta go i don't remember the title offhand so i don't want to give you the wrong title but it's basically a gang of uh a gang of cats and uh the way that the storytelling is done is you'll see them as uh, human beings every once in a while. Uh, it's called uh, the letter N and the Yankees. So I'm not sure, N- Yankees, or maybe the N is just silent, it's Yankees. Uh, but it's this, uh, you know, these, these street, street gang, but it's actually cats. But in some of the, uh, in some of the, the storytelling, you'll see them as human people. Uh, and it's just kind of a, it's just an interesting going back and forth between the two uh, on um, the, the, the way that the creator decides to, okay, this time I'm going to tell the story with the cats. When, like, you know, they get beat, like, for example, they're, they're in a fight. So there's a fist fight between the humans, but then suddenly the cops show up or somebody comes out of the building screaming at them to get them run off. And then suddenly you see them as cats scurrying away. So. And being a big cat person, that automatically attracted me to that. So I've been reading that, and I really hope to see an anime version of it someday. Um, any, uh, you know, we talked about some of the classics. Uh, any real, any more modern series? You know, there, it's, I want to say there's a boom in anime, but there's like a lot of, uh, there, there, there's quite a few series now where like, you know, the peop- the fans of anime now are talking about these like we used to talk about Bebop and Dragon Ball Z and Gundam. Are you interested in any of these, more of these new ones? Oh, absolutely. I could I could rattle off a whole bunch. My wife and I pretty much either watch live-action Korea drama or we're watching Japanese animation. That's most of what we do leisure time together when we're watching something. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, if you want some uh, Korean drama or Korean action, you know, live-action Korean stuff, I can tell you about that too, but... Uh, you know, Demon Slayer. Okay. Everybody, you know, if you're on the fence about anime, you want a good, like, brand new show, get into Demon Slayer. Uh, the Demon Slayer movie just was released in Japan in late 2020, and it did more money than, um, like, the biggest uh, Western blockbuster uh, during, the, during the time period. So it, it's like gangbusters. We're probably going to see, you know, live-action developments and deals like coming out the wazoo for this. It's a really great solid story. Check out Demon Slayer. Check out Goblin Slayer. That one's a little on the dark side, but that one's cool. Um, I'm looking forward to starting the second season of uh, that time I was reincarnated as a slime. 
Uh, the, uh, <laughs> uh, fairy tale. Not, it's not new, new, um, but it's it it just recently wrapped up and ended. So we're still finishing fairy tale. That's got like hundreds and hundreds of episodes. Um, I've never seen One Piece. That's one I'm going to start someday, but that's one of those things where there's already a thousand episodes. Oh, I don't want right. to commit to. I, I want to commit to that. I, I just want got a little sidebar. I want to check out One Piece just because um, one of my all time favorite wrestlers, Minoru Suzuki, is a huge One Piece fan, and I found yeah. out that the way he cuts his hair is due to something that's in One Piece. So. Oh, I definitely want cool. to check that yeah, out. Yeah. Now I learned something. That's that's pretty neat. The uh, character design in One Piece is great. I've drawn some of the characters, so I know it's something I'm probably going to enjoy. But again, it's just like it's just like with JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. There's so much of it. I'm like I feel overwhelmed at the start. <laughs> um, my two new favorite. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say the, the newest one that I'm on right now. It's called Juju Kaisen. Okay. Um, that one just came out. I think they've dropped their like tenth or eleventh episode. That one's really good, and one that I definitely recommend for you to check out because I feel like you'll enjoy this because we hit on a lot of the same like noir, you know, the Bruce Wayne, uh, Batman, the um, uh, but James Bond type stuff. Check out uh, Balance Unlimited Millionaire Detective. Balance. I need to type that out so that way I can remember that. Um, yeah. Balance Unlimited. Uh, it's basically Millionaire Detective, but the, the name of the show is Balance Unlimited. Okay. And the ideas of it is that you've got this super rich, wealthy young guy who decides to become a detective. And he just waltzes right in and says, I'm a detective. Here's a bunch of money. Whatever havoc I cause, I'll pay for. <laughs> Definitely check that out. Um, my two favorites right now are um, One Punch Man and... Uh... Uh, My Hero Academia kind of, you know, touches on the, the superhero fandom in me. Or you, have you checked oh out any gosh, of those yet? Yeah, My Hero Academia is wonderful, and I, I I get a lot of people mad when I say this, but the Japanese did superheroes better than the West. Come on. <laughs> <sighs> I don't know if I'll completely they agree kick with their butts. They kick I, their butts. I don't know if I'll completely agree with that, but I will agree <laughs> with. I I can see where someone would say that if you're picking up uh, on superheroes. And the comic books now, I can definitely see yeah. that point, but I don't know. No, I don't know if I'm I completely not, I'm not agree with that. I'm not saying historically. I'm not saying historically. I'm saying right now, the best superhero story is My Hero Academia for current years, current gen stuff. That's that's fair. I can I can that I can't agree with. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, so that is uh, great. I love these. I love this. Is a great conversation. <laughs> um, I'm definitely hoping uh, down the road we can definitely have you back for another conversation or bring a, another discussion for anime or uh, manga. Do some kind of review together. I, I know your time is very valuable. You got your your own stuff, and uh, you know you're doing doing your art. Uh, if you'd like to talk about where they can look you up again, if they have a uh... yeah, please uh, please go and support Dreaded Dinosaur Man on Webtoon. I'm trying to finish up the next chapter. Uh, I got a lot of other stuff going on right now, though, so it's taken me a little while. But I really need people over there to subscribe and and jump on board because I have big plans for that character, which will include a crowdfunded uh, comic, physical comic book later on in the year. Um, of course, you can go to erichodson.com, click buy prints, help me pay the rent. That'd be wonderful. Uh, that's Eric with a K. And um, then uh, you know I will be for if anybody's listening in Miami, Florida. As of right now, it's not canceled. I will be at Otaku Fest at uh, Double Tree Miami Airport. So that's uh, twenty uh, yeah, January twenty third and twenty fourth. So awesome! Yeah, definitely. Finally, uh, finally doing a con again. <laughs> finally, yeah, it's. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping I get to go to another convention this year. And uh, if um, you are one of the wrestling fans that decided to sit through a, a complete uh, comic book and. Anime and manga nerding out session. Uh, definitely uh, check out uh, High Spots. Uh, pick up some of uh, Eric Hodson's art. Uh, usually autographed. So if you going through uh, High Spots and you you see yes, an Eric Hodson piece, uh, pick that up. Uh, definitely. And and don't forget Pro Wrestling Tees. You can get the Roddy Roddy Piper comic book. Yes, during the interview, I just got the because uh, last time we interviewed, I bought it. During this interview, I get the email that this is shipped. So. Sweet. Um, <laughs> That is a uh, that is a uh, definitely uh, something you should pick up and go follow Eric. Uh, go go help him out and uh, 
Also follow me on my social media platforms, facebook.com slash athletic geek, a nine Twitter, athletic underscore geek, a nine Instagram, athletic geek, a nine. If you'd like to help the channel out financially, I am on Patreon, patreon.com slash athletic geek, a nine. If you enjoyed the video, please give the like, share, subscribe for more content from every corner of the geek universe, wrestling, comics, anime, gaming. And, uh, thanks to Eric Hudson again. If we can find another, uh, Another project we can collaborate on. I definitely will have him back. And uh, you all have a good one.